What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to another Fall Obsession podcast. My name is Sam Thrash. I'm the show host over here at Fall Obsession. Thanks for tuning in. This week, I am on here with a good friend of mine. He's been on the podcast before, actually, but it's been a minute. Mr. Jesse Johnson from down here in Texas. He is a huge public land hunter and an avid traditional bow hunter. Really awesome dude, good Christian guy, and uh, really enjoy my friendship with him and everything and getting to get on here and talk a little bit of hunting with him. Uh, he was on our show back in the, I don't know, episode 92 or 93, somewhere somewhere in there. So it's been over 100 episodes, but um, we catch up, talk a little bit about his public land hunting adventures, talk some traditional archery, and then a couple of uh, larger adventures that he's had out of state in Colorado doing an elk hunt and then also going to Canada for a bear hunt talk about those adventures and the the trials and the successes of such so always a good time just to sit down on here and talk hunting so hope you guys enjoy this conversation he's one of the best bow hunters i know and one of the best woodsmen i know so got some good nuggets in here for you guys but before we get to the episode with jesse gotta hit a few things with our sponsors here as you guys know first and foremost hoot camo rocking a shirt in the podcast video we started our partnership with Hoot last year and wore their gear in many different environments last year. Texas, Colorado, trees, flatlands, CRPs, um, scrub brush, you name it. And really, really pleased with the gear. The quality is all there. The warmth is there in the cold weather. We were in the single digits at times up in Colorado, and I just had on a good base layer, my Hoot fleece, and then my Hoot heavyweight outerwear and i was perfectly comfortable for the entire week it it was absolutely amazing so the pattern also adapts to many different environments and everything is very versatile it's awesome to to see the science behind that and everything so if you guys are looking to get into a new set of good quality camouflage gear i recommend you check out hoot camo on top of it all they're at a price point that's realistic for the blue collar hunter. If you are looking to get into a high quality set of gear, you can go to their website and see that their prices are very competitive in that regard. And if even if you're not getting a full set of gear, you can shop just general lifestyle wear, fishing gear, golf gear, that kind of stuff. Hoot makes all that kind of all that kind of gear as well. So hootcamo.com, go check them out. And if you want to place an order, use the code FALLOBSESSION15. That will save you some money at checkout. News on Safaris is a new Fall Obsession podcast partner. We have had some members of our own team as well as other people that we know outside of our organization that have hunted with News on in Africa and had an amazing experience. They treat people right and they have a lot of different uh, hunts and opportunities to offer down there. If you are interested in hearing a little bit about them, we actually have some podcasts in our in our archive um, with one of our guys that has hunted with them multiple times that you guys can go back and listen to. And um, if you're interested in booking a hunt with News On or just simply learning more about the opportunity, you can contact Tim. His phone number is 303-946-9441. And News On also has a deal for you guys. If you tell Tim that Fall Obsession sent you his way, they got some savings for y'all. And that includes a $500 trophy credit, free lodging, food, and drinks. Your professional hunter, tracker, and skinner fees are covered. Some basic trophy prep is taken care of. All that stuff combines for a $2,250 value per hunter, and that's redeemable for up to four people in your party. So just for telling Tim that Fall Obsession sent you their way, you guys, a party of four could get $9,000 in savings on their safari. So that's a pretty that's a pretty smoking deal if you ask me. So if you're looking at an African safari, going on one of those big adventures, you guys need to book with news on safaris elite archery is a fall obsession partner i've been shooting an elite bow for several seasons now absolutely love it got an ethos on the way should be here any day now and i cannot wait to rock that bow in 2024 i can sit up here and talk to you guys the whole podcast potentially about how much i love elite and why i love elite and why i think you should shoot elite 
But the ultimate test and to see if it's right for you is going to be going to your local elite dealer and taking the elite shootability challenge. That's even what elite archery themselves recommend that you do. Go get their bows in their hand, shoot them, compare them to other bows, compare them to your bow right now, and see what you think. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. And even if you haven't shot an elite bow in a long time, maybe you're thinking of one from way back when, um, when they first started their, their bow brand. Um, technology in the archery industry changes very, very quickly, and Elite has taken full advantage of that, and the technology that they put into their bows is some of the best out there, in, in my opinion. So go to your local Elite dealer and take the Elite Shootability Challenge today. The Outdoor Call Radio app is a podcast partner, Outdoors Dan from Respect the Game TV. He created an app that you can download on any device where you can stream hunting shows and podcasts on a loop every single week. Fall Obsession podcast plays on that loop on Mondays, the same day as our new publications. And there's also tons of other hunting shows and podcasts that play on that app every single day. Um, So I recommend that you guys go download it if you haven't already. It is free free and you can start streaming immediately and also go follow the outdoor call radio app on social media on facebook follow outdoors dan on facebook outdoors dan does a couple of different live radio shows at local midwestern radio stations throughout the week and even if you're not local to tune into to those radio stations he shares the broadcast on his facebook live so again the outdoor call radio app and outdoors dan go check out what they're doing over there Last but not least, Ridge Rock Hunt Company is a podcast partner. Derek Eaves is the man over there in Mississippi, and he books hunts with vetted and trusted outfitters across North America. So if you are looking for that next adventure, perhaps a -a once-in-a-lifetime hunt that you've been saving up for, give Derek a call. He'll work with you on all the details and find something that you're looking for, again, with a vetted and trusted outfitter that he himself believes in and has potentially hunted with himself. He, He makes it a point to try and hunt with as many of his own outfitters in his network as he can. So Derek Eaves, Ridge Rock Hunt Company, book your next North American hunt with them. Finally, thank you guys again for listening to another Fall Obsession podcast. I'll be as brief as I can with this, but we always appreciate the support of the Fall Obsession brand in whatever form or fashion you guys are able to do. We obviously have like shirts and hats and stuff like that for sale on our website, fallobsession.com, but the best and easiest and cheapest way that you guys can support us is simply by hitting the like button and hitting the share button and subscribing if that's an option. That helps us way more than you guys may even realize. So please, 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 if you don't do anything else, I ask that you do that. And also leave a review on this podcast. That's something that not a lot of folks do on their uh, preferred streaming apps. But please leave us a review and let us know what you think of the show. Or if you have general feedback for the show, we'd love to hear that as well, whether it's in the comments on social media or if you want to send us a message uh, directly to us, we would love to to talk with you about it. Go to fallobsession.com, check out the website, all of the content streams through there, and check out our shows on Carbon TV. This podcast streams on Carbon TV as well as three other Fall Obsession series. Our Texas Dirt and Midwest Mindset hunting shows stream on there. Those are... um, whitetail and habitat management series and and like i said whitetail hunting shows and then our staff inspired series couch chats also streams on carbon tv you guys can find that on the carbon tv app or by pulling it up on your computer as well or your smart tv you can get it on there as well and we are up for another carbon award through the carbon tv network again this year i don't have yet the information on which award Fall Obsession has been nominated for, but this is our second consecutive year now where we have been nominated for one, if not more, Carbon TV awards. So please stay tuned to the social medias because we are going to be sharing a lot of info on how you can support us through the Carbon Awards this year coming up in the month of August. With that, I'm going to take it to our conversation with the Jesse Johnson down here in Texas. You guys are listening to another Fall Obsession podcast. Oh, you got her, dude. She's down. Let's go. Dude, I just shot a deer of a lifetime. Breaking smoke team. One with nature, and if you're a believer, one with God. Definitely get your heart pumping. Boy, you are in trouble. 
Level Obsession Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to another Fall Obsession Podcast. I'm Sam, hosting you guys, and I am joined by a good friend of mine, known him for a while. He's been on the show before, but it's been a minute, Mr. Jesse Johnson. Welcome back to Fall Obsession Podcast, man. Thank you, buddy. Look forward to it. Yeah, I'm excited, man. We had you on over 100 episodes now, um, talking about some public land hunting and everything that you're passionately into. Um, but I wanted to take a second for new listeners that are uh, joining our show and everything. Just wanted you to introduce yourself again and uh, talk about what you hunt in Texas. <laughs> it works for me. Uh, so anytime I introduce myself, I tell everybody I'm not a native Texan. I, uh, I was born and raised in South Louisiana. Um, didn't move to Texas till I was seven, eight, about to be 18. Yeah, so 18. Um, grew up hunting down in the South, kind of classic deer hunting down there, uh, hunting family, uh, uncles, grandfathers, all that. And then moved up to Texas and, um, have gotten into a mess of stuff, picked up a traditional bow, uh, lovingly referred to as a stick bow, well, I guess about five or six years ago now and, uh, fell in love with that. And, um, not only that, when I moved here, I didn't really have my connections to family properties or, or places I had grown up hunting. Uh, I was eight, nine hours away from those places. Um, so as a, a broke college kid, public land was my only option and just dove in head first with the longbow and uh, I've been hunting public ever since and have had some really good adventures, a lot of lessons learned. But uh, like you said, man, I've just fallen in love with it. It's really become kind of a passion uh, hunting, not only public land in Texas, but just all over and uh, anywhere I can go with my bow. What's the draw to public land for you? Um, I think just unlimited areas like, uh, you know, growing up our leases and everything in deer camps, you kind of were assigned to one spot and, you know, you had 10 box stands and eight bow stands that you could pick through and, you know, seeing the same deer and hunting the same stands, you know, I enjoyed it, but you start getting into public land and you realize you have hundreds of thousands of acres that you'll probably never see every square foot of it that you can explore um, and just unlimited access to those type places. Um, it allowed me to start hunting out Midwest uh, on a budget, you know, not being able to afford to do the big outfitter hunts. Um, so probably that just kind of exploration of it. It's a, it's an extreme challenge. Uh, you know, you're, yeah, where I hunt at, you have to lower your expectations a little bit. Um, not not quite able to do the whole managing side of thing as much. Um, can't be as picky, but I just enjoy the adventure of it. And, and there's nothing, in my opinion, uh, and no better feeling than going on public land, just fair chase, uh, having access to animals and ground that everybody has access on, access to and, and being successful. It's just, it's addicting for me. Absolutely. So public i'm and i mean you know me i'm i hunt private land and have kind of right. grown up in that world and everything haven't ventured at least in texas much outside of that but it it seems like texas has a reputation with public land of just being jam-packed full of people is that accurate right. um so where i'm at north texas you know a lot of times that's people excuses for not hunting. It's not terrible. I mean, you're going to have encounters with other people, but you learn how to work around them. Uh, and if you put effort in and you don't just go, you know, to the easiest accessible spots, you get creative. It's not terrible. I bet. I mean, I bet in a, a hunting season, oh, let's say I bet I make over a hundred sits every year. And I'd say maybe over a hundred sits. It's three to five hunts are ruined by somebody walking in and I've killed deer. I mean, I've killed deer 10 minutes after seeing somebody like public land of the air used to it. So no, it gets a bad rap. Um, but being North Texas area, I'm also able to jump across the border and go into Oklahoma and Oklahoma has a lot more public land than Texas does. So I can kind of jump around. I try to focus in on the archery only WMAs. Um, so there's ways around it, but it, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. Yeah. Are you archery only truly? Um, no, no, I will, uh, especially if archery season's tough on me, I'll, I'll break out a gun in November for sure. Uh, 
Um, Thanksgiving week's normally a pretty good, successful week for me and the family. Uh, we'll break out guns that weekend and maybe take a doe. I've killed a couple big bucks uh, on Thanksgiving week. Um, I put in for some draw hunts this year that are rifle only. So, like, I'd say 75% archery, 25% gun. Um, I kind of got into flintlocks a few years ago messing with that. I mean, I, I, it, I'm like you. I'd much rather have a bow in my hand, but sometimes you just got to get even and, and grab a gun and make it happen. But uh, um, I, I prefer to be bow hunting, but I definitely do do some rifle hunting. Yeah. So what's what's your loadout, like typical public land hunt or sit? Um, wh- what are you packing out there with you? What's your setup? I've kept it. I dwindled down when I first started. I brought way too much stuff. Um and not only did I get sick of carrying all that stuff because it, it was just too heavy, but then also when I kind of started going out Midwest hunting and doing six, seven-day backpacking hunts, I realized I was bringing way too much stuff for local hunts. Um, so normally it's a, a quality backpack uh, with binos, water, license tags, knives, maybe a, a jacket, and then um, somewhere you definitely got to spend your money on, in my opinion. For public is a high quality lightweight tree stand setup, uh, so I use a um, a uh, Lone Wolf Custom Gear .5 with four uh, double stick, no four single sticks and some aiders, and that's probably the most valuable thing. It it just it allows you to get under ten pounds on your back, and um, I, I've messed with saddles a little bit, and they still have good use for me. There's a few spots that I hunt every year that a saddle is your best option. Or if I'm double hunting with my dad or maybe my wife, I'll get behind them in a saddle. But most of the time, it's a lightweight tree stand with a backpack and as minimum gear as I can bring. Yeah. I have to say, uh, your your success on public land makes me feel <laughs> feel a little little lazy on private because I uh, you kill far more than I do, I feel like. <laughs> and uh... Uh, Well, it's because I, I shoot a lot of animals that you have the ability to pass on the walk, uh, in the attempt to, to manage, you know, around here, if you, you pass on a good deer, you're probably going to hear a gun go off 200 yards down the way. And, you know, on a handful of occasion and five or six years of hunting public land pretty hard, like maybe two or three times the following season, did I see a deer that I saw the year before, not saying they all get killed, but you definitely lower your, uh, your standards for public land hunting, especially when you're shooting a stick. Um, so, uh, I'm always jealous of, uh, some of the big bucks you're chasing. Well, uh, chasing is one thing, killing's another thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, for but sure. for I, sure. I, I understand what you're saying. There's, there's a different, uh, there's a different standard for, for that scenario. And like, yeah. uh, closest thing I have to relate it to, I guess, is like the, the out of state hunts that I've gone on in Montana or Colorado and whatnot. It's like, um, I'm not waiting, you know, especially yeah. bow hunting. I'm I'm taking the first thing I have a, a crack at. So I I understand no, sure. I understand that that side of it. I have I have a buddy too down here uh, that has his own show and his own podcast, Johnny Mac, and he uh, he came from Washington State, and that's that's a battle he's fought because now he you know going from only hunting public land up there to now he has a deer lease down here, and his first year on the place he's sending me pictures of you know these three-year-old eight points and he's all excited and <laughs> I, I, yep. I deflated his balloon a little bit i was like hey man i, I get it you're you're hunting texas it's your first year like go for it i said i'm you're asking right. me if i'm gonna shoot the deer the answer is no <laughs> for sure no i mean i still have a little bit of louisiana in me so it's hard to get away from that but uh no i mean it's kind of each their own i i respect anybody that's getting out there and it's whatever you love i have a buddy that he is very target buck specific. He runs a ton of cameras on public and he hunts hard and, but he's going to hunt down one specific deer, a mature deer, and he'll go, you know, he might go two, three seasons without shooting a buck, but he's surprised me a few times being able to get on public and kill a a target buck, but that's not really my game yet in life. That's gotta be pretty, pretty rewarding. I'd imagine target buck on public. He's a, he's a flight attendant though. So he can literally like, work his schedule where he'll have four weeks off and hunt the entire month of November every day. So I, he, he's got a little bit of advantage over us. <laughs> I think like, yes, like last year he hunted 21 days in a row. And I'm like, man, oh, that's, wow. you can, you can pattern some deer if you can hunt them 21 days in a row. 
Absolutely. Wow. That's awesome. Yep. So definitely, you know, an archer at heart. Um, and as you mentioned, that's if, if you had to choose, you'd be, you'd be leaning that way. Um, but you did like you all together hung up your, com, uh, yeah, your compound this past year, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I'm probably, I think I'm in, I think this will be my third season. Uh, I took my compound on elk hunt two years ago and that was kind of it for me. Um, so yeah, pretty much the last few years have been strictly traditional bow only. Wow. So, yeah. so what's the, what's the draw to the stick and string? I don't know. Uh, a glutton for punishment. I don't know. It, <laughs> it's not as bad as, as like to joke and make it sound. Um, I mean, it's kind of just one of those things that's like comparable to fly fishing or, you know, something else. It's just like one of those things I've tried to get people into it and I've been successful and non-successful. And normally within the first five minutes, you can tell if they're going to be drawn to it. It's, it's kind of like a, almost a mysterious type interest in it. And I shot one when I was like 15 years old and fell in love with it. Just thought it was the coolest thing ever. The simplicity of it, the, the effort that went into it, you know, the, the hands-on, I got a buddy right now that's transitioning it over slowly. And, uh, he was texting me some kind of troubleshooting, like, what am I doing wrong? And I, I texted him and I said, you know, when you're shooting a compound, 80% of the work as far as making the shot is done within the machine and 20% of it's up to you. And it's reverse of the trad bow, like 20% of it's in the bow and 80% of it's up to you. And there's nothing wrong with shooting a compound. There's nothing wrong with shooting a trad bow, but I just, I love the challenge of it. Uh, I love how close they have to be. You know, it's uh, 20 yards and in at 20 yards, I'm starting to put tension on the string, but 15 and in has really become my wheelhouse. Uh, and I love the challenge of it. When I was younger, I had the opportunity to hunt some really good private land. Um, and I, I was blessed to have a lot of kills under my belt, I guess, so to say. Um, so that itch went away for me earlier, early. It, it didn't come at, it, it wasn't all about success and the, the kill sense. Uh, it more became about the challenge. So I just, I fell in love with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little scared to try it. I, I already am, am bow only and I'm worried that if I go a step farther and fall in love with it, that my freezer is going to be even more empty given my, given my luck that is. <laughs> I, well, I tell people all the time, Texas is a great place to start. Keep your compound during deer season. Just keep doing your thing. But if you have access to hogs and can bait up hogs, that's a great way to kind of get your feet wet in it, get them coming into a feeder and controlled environment. And I mean, once you take a couple pigs or something off a trad bill, you'll fall in love with it. But I, I mean, I tell guys all the time, I have a buddy that's into it right now. Um, and I told him, I said, do not freak out and sell your compound and just go all in like, you know, start off season, get your dough on the ground, maybe get a buck or something, and then say the entire month of December, I'm going to haul a trad bow and see if you like it. Like one of my best friends, he's he's compound this weekend and trad this weekend. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, I encourage everybody to try it. There doesn't have to be sides of who's better or what you do. Just it's like me going from a trad bow to a rifle. Like my buddies will message me and they're like, how do you hunt with a trad bow? You know, so strict. And they pick up a gun and kill one. I'm like, because it, it doesn't matter to me. Like, I enjoy bow hunting for what it is, and I enjoy gun hunting for what it is. Yeah. No, it, so. it's to each his own for sure. And it's, you know, personal preferences and convictions and, and that kind of thing is what it boils yeah. down to. And, and you're spot on. We're not here to we're not here to, to judge or, you know, throw shade or anything like that. It's just, you know. For sure. It, build each other up and as long celebrate. As, you're being, as long as you're being ethical about it. Yeah. following the game laws and you know just being a good uh representation of bow hunters then i'm all for whatever whoever's whoever's doing what yeah so and i'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into the archery side just because of my archery brain as i call it um but what's your what's your holding point and your aiming point like with with your trad bow and how do you how do you prepare and side in if you will for you know you were talking about putting tension on the string at 20 and 15 being your wheelhouse what's what's the difference look like for you as an archer um 
so when I first started shooting a traditional bow, I was very dead set. I wanted to be an instinctive archer. Um, and to explain that real quick, if someone doesn't mean, that means you literally, you grip the bow, you bear down on the spot you want to hit. You're not paying attention to the tip of your arrow. You're just focusing on the spot and you draw, you hit anchor and you let go. It's comparable to, you know, you don't see a baseball player, a pitcher line up a baseball and squint. They just, they pick out the, the catcher's mitt and they throw it at it. That's how I wanted to be. That is not how I could do it. I had a major struggle for two to three years forcing myself to do that. I could go out and on a target, take the same shot and be consistent. Um, but then you put me in a tree stand and I was at an angle or the depth perception was different and I was missing deer like crazy. So I finally said, you know what? I was never a good pitcher, so maybe I'm never going to be uh, a good uh, instinctive archer. So I got with one of my good friends, was blessed. He's a decorated archer in the traditional side. And I said, hey, I need to figure out something to be consistent. And he taught me the gapping method. And all, all gapping is is you're paying attention to the tip of your arrow. So you draw back and you line up, you look down straight down your arrow and that aligns your left and right. And then the tip of your arrow will be under where you want to hit. For me, my gap is like 15 inches. Um, Mm. So if I want to hit a bullseye, I got to hold the tip of my arrow about 15 inches below that, you know, on a deer, that's roughly their elbow. Um, It almost becomes a little bit instinctive. Like I don't really sit there and think, okay, that's 15 inches below. Like, it's kind of like, you don't have to think about, okay, is my top site, my 20 yard or whatever. You just kind of know you're used to your yardages. Um, so I use a gapping method, aiming aware of where my arrow is. And from there, all it is, is a three-step process. Um, it's acquire a spot. Okay. I want to hit this deer. I want to hit whatever this animal is right here. And I acquire that spot and think about where 15 inches is inches. I draw and hit my anchor. My anchor is my index finger to the corner of my mouth. Mm -hmm. And then I lean into my shot and I start engaging back tension, which means I'm pulling through. Um, because if you, if you pluck on a trad bow and throw out this way or pull back this way, you'll pull your shot left or right. So it's very important as like, uh, what are they, what are the hinge hinge release? Like a hinge or back tension or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I do is I hit anchor and I begin to pull, I pull and through my shot and my, are you familiar with psycho triggers and mm-hmm. that type of thing of archery? When I feel the feather of my nose, let me grab an arrow. Yeah. I'm pulling through my shot. And when I feel the tip of that feather touch my nose, that's my psycho trigger. Mm-hmm. So I can pretty much break target panic. Cause if I'm just sitting there trying to do it, I'll lose my mind. So I can pick my spot start drawing and then I can quit thinking about aiming and I'm just pulling. And as soon as I feel that hit, that arrow has gone mm-hmm. and it acts as a psycho trigger for me. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty simple process. Just, uh, acquire a line and apply back pressure. And if I can go through those three things, and most of the time I'm pretty consistent, uh, a quote unquote simple process, but yet for a novice definitely wouldn't sound yeah. like one and takes takes practice, discipline, and some muscle memory development to yeah. to be able to execute that consistently, I'm sure. And it's it's weird when you transition. Like, I've gone, the first couple of years, I'd go back to a compound. And actually, once you get used to it and you start shooting a compound again, you realize how much can go wrong. Like, are your yoke out of time? Uh, you know, is your alignment a little bit different? Is your sight moved? Um, are you still in tune? Like, I've actually got to the point where, like, I love the simplicity of if I screw up, it's me. It's not the bow. You, I mean, I know you've had it. You've gone out there and done the same thing, and yeah. your bow got out of time. Your sight got bumped. Like, there's no excuses. It's like, nope, I'm just, I suck today. <laughs> That's <laughs> what it is. So I've learned to enjoy it that way. But I tell anybody, if you're going to get into traditional archery, um, if you listen to this, send me a message. I'd love to help you. Just try to go to an aiming method and a process and you will find success and consistency way quicker than trying to shoot instinctive. I've had buddies pick up a bow, shoot it for a week and kill a deer or kill a hog a week later because they developed a process and 
just put it to the test and it, it worked. That's awesome. How yep. much weight are you pulling? Um, I shoot between 45 and 50 pounds. I have one 50 pound bow and one 45. And obviously the further you draw back, the more poundage, but at my draw length, I'm shooting about 46 at my draw length. And then on my 50 pound bow, um, I'm shooting like 49, 50 right on the verge right there. Gotcha. And is there anything specific that you look for in a bow, like a, a traditional bow? I prefer long bows over recurves. Um, that's probably 90% aesthetic. I just like the way they look better. Um, I feel like they're more forgiving. You have a lot more energy um, loaded up into that limb. It's like a radical compound versus like a more uh, parallel limb type thing. You don't have as much energy loaded up. So if you mess up, it, it's more forgiving. So I prefer a long bow. I like about 60 inches um in length uh, i like a an act like i don't like a straight limb grip i mean a straight profile grip i want like a like a think of think of like the old school hoyt wood grips real deep valley yeah. like really get your hand in there i want like something that's a locator grip real repeatable um i don't care really about speed quiet's very important quiet because of the speed you know it doesn't matter 30 feet per second doesn't matter to a deer they if they duck they duck i mean you've had deer duck on a compound and i'll never be that fast but if i can keep it quiet and reduce their duck i find that's a lot more efficient that makes sense what about your arrow build what's that look like um i wouldn't say i nerd out on arrows but i had to learn a lot when i got in traditional to make it efficient um i prefer an arrow between 540 and 600 grains. Uh, the reason I like that for my poundage is because, you know, when you shoot a trad bow, you have a, a lot bigger arc. So if you can keep that arc flatter longer and not shoot too big of an arrow that's gonna drop in, and you can shoot, you know, a heavy enough arrow to where you get good penetration, but you can keep a window of time where that arrow's staying on a very flat plane pretty much from 20 yards to 12 yards, your gap is the same. I'm not like 15 yards, I gotta hold 18 inches below and 20 yards, I gotta hold 12 inches below. I try to build my arrows where I'm hitting that plane perfectly at that timeline so I can just think, hey, if that deer is 20 and in, I can hold here and it's gonna hit its mark every time. So I'm pretty strict on that. I'm a major fan of cut on contact. Trad bows don't, have the energy to open up an expandable you they have the energy but you'll lose too much so i shoot a three blade cut on contact 550 to 600 grains um with three five inch feather fletchings uh and i predominantly shoot carbon but i also shoot wood arrows during deer season i shoot wood arrows a lot but typically in the off season or any travel hunts i go back to carbon just for their strength yeah that makes sense that's awesome yep. well another Another thing I wanted to to talk to you about are, are a couple things, a couple trips that you've had the opportunity to go on since we last spoke on here, that is. And one of them was last year you got to got to go up and put together a little elk hunt. I wanted to talk yep. to you about that and hear the story on that one. Yeah, for sure. So uh, it, was, it was about a four-year quest. I started hunting over-the-counter um, archery in Colorado about four years ago. Um, and my first year was archery, brought a compound. Um, we worked a couple bulls, had a good hunt, uh, and had a game plan for the next year. Um, the second year was rough. Uh, it was hot, hot September, not a lot of bulls, just real. It was, it was a rough, um, rough week. And I'll get more into the detail of how the hunt works. Uh, when we get to the fourth year, the best year. Third year, I went solo. Um, uh, I think we were coming out of COVID. Work was tight for everybody. Things were tense in the world, and I just wasn't going to miss it. So I went solo, and uh, that was a really good experience. Seven days in the backcountry of Colorado by yourself. Uh, it, you have to be ready for that. Um, a lot of mileage uh, at that point in time, hiking in 15, 16 miles. Uh and that was a really good self-experience. 
probably wouldn't do it again just because after this last year and handling an elk, packing out an elk, it's a lot to take on. Um, I would recommend trying to go with somebody just for the load of camp life. Third year, nothing happened, had some good encounters. And then my fourth year, I had enough points for that same area we had been hunting to draw muzzleloader. So I went ahead and cashed in my muzzleloader. Um, Colorado muzzleloader is at least where we're at. Um, it's only open sights. You can't have a scope on your gun and it has to be real black, like not real black powder, but it can't be the pellets it has to be real powder. So it's, it's a 50, 50 yard and in game, maybe 75 yards. If you're a good enough shot, I wanted to keep it 50, 60 yards. Um, but kind of how that hunt went, uh, we take off drive from Texas to Colorado and the first few years we did it, we hiked in this year, we had gotten a hold of a rancher and developed a relationship with him and actually rented horses from him. Oh, and, wow. uh, we packed in horses. He rode in with us and brought them out. Um, but we went in like 15, 16 miles with each of us had a horse and then a pack horse behind us. We brought in, uh, some, you know, the past years we had done lightweight, real, you know, backpacky type stuff. We brought in a soft side cooler. We brought in a good tent. You know, we were, we were on the mountain this year living right. We even uh, brought in a uh, one cooler of dry ice and some ribeyes to eat one night. There you go. Still a really tough hunt, but the horses were worth it. So get there on a Sunday. He packs us in, um, pretty much hunt from Monday till Friday and then kind of get everything loaded up and pack out Saturday afternoon. Uh, pretty good little ride in. And it was pretty funny cause you know, growing up, we had neighbors with horses and I rode a little bit, but definitely not like a cowboy riding a lot or anything. And Sam, I tell you 15 hours, I'm sorry, 10 hours on a horse, <laughs> bro. I couldn't walk the next day. I was dying. Like, I think I'd rather walked in cause I was so sore. And I mean, we went from 7,000 feet to 11,000 feet and you're trusting a horse on the side of a mountain trail that I'm not lying it's this wide. Like there was a pucker factor. Oh yeah. There was a few times I almost was like, I'm getting off this horse and walking him because I don't want him to slip, but pack in, set up camp and then start hunting the next day. Um, we, if you, if you over the counter units, hunt elk in Colorado, you learn real fast that bugling is not your best, in my opinion, your best option. I mean, it, it sounds like a war zone in the morning in Colorado guys, just screaming on bugles. Uh, and you can tell, man, when it sounds like someone's blowing it through a Nerf gun, it's like, that's not an elk. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's crazy. Cause at night, two, three in the morning, we're hearing bugles all night. But at daylight, they shut up. They don't talk. Those elk are educated. So we started having a lot more success over the last years. Light cow calls, still hunting, still hunting through areas we knew were sign, you know, rubs, wallows, bedding, droppings. And, I mean, just really slipping through there, just squeaks. Uh, and um, we hunted for three days doing about five to six miles a day in the morning. You know, you hunt low when the thermals are coming down about 10 o'clock thermal start shifting up, shoot up the mountain, hunt high, you know, trying to catch something. And then about one o'clock coming down the mountain and we really don't hunt evenings too much. Uh, you have a very small window in the evening where the thermals are behaving and we'll go out some in the evening. I'll sit a wallow, I'll, you know, kind of scout a little bit, but it, our, our eggs in the basket were in the morning and morning three, I think morning three, we got on a little shelf that in the past years I had found some really good bedding on. And, uh, I had my partner with me. He was calling. I was on the gun. You know, when we go back next year, I'll probably be calling and he'll be on the gun. And, um, we stopped on this little area and I told him, I said, I know elk were bedding there last year. It's still good sign in here. Let's stop and call. And uh, I went up about 30, 40 yards, got set up, gave him the thumbs up. And he hit just a little cow mew and a very distinctive crack in a limb. Just not like a squirrel, not a chipmunk, just a clink. And I looked at him and I said, that, that was an elk. And he was like, are you sure? And I said, yeah, that, 
that was an elk. Like that was a big animal. Um, I heard another crack and I said, they're looping and our thermals were kind of still coming down, but starting to transition up. And I knew he was circling around to get the wind. And, uh, then I heard a really familiar noise. If you're deer hunting, I could hear tines in branches. Yeah. Like I heard dragging and I was, I told him, I said, an, an elk's coming and he hit another mew and I'm already propped up on the side of the tree thinking, man, please Lord, let this happen. And, uh, right about that time I looked and there was a good size Aspen tree and I could see a tine on this side and a tine on this side and I could see it just, and it was not, I didn't, I like, I killed like equivalent of like a cow horn spike, uh, to a deer. Like I did not kill a big elk. It was a three-year-old elk, but I mean, over the counter in Colorado, I, if it was legal, I was killing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, so I'm sitting there and he's just kind of watching and turning his head, but he knows where I'm at. And he's like, mm, there's, there's not a cow up there. And I hear my partner behind me saying, shoot. And I'm like, I can't. And he's saying, shoot. And I'm like, I can't. The bull is 60 yards. And I'm kind of irritated that he's talking. And I'm like, there's a tree in front of him. I can't shoot. So finally, my bull turns and angles up, and I think it was 66 steps, and he turned his shoulder, and I squeezed off a shot, and the smoke cleared. I mean, if you've ever seen a muzzleloader for the first couple of seconds, you can't see what happened. And the smoke cleared, and my bull was just standing there. And I'm like, oh, no, four years of this, and I just blew this shot. And... In my head a little bit, I was thinking we had had some rain, and I was wondering, did I get a weird charge? Did I pull the shot? And then the elk just turns, and when I tell you walked out of sight, and my heart was broke, I said, I just ruined a four-year quest. Like, it could be mm. it could be another four years. It could be eight years till I kill a bull. And then I hear my partner, reload and shoot. And I'm like, I can't see him. He said, Reload. So I'm starting to reload and he's, I reload and I turn around and look and he's like, shoot. And I'm like, he's gone. And I turn and there's another bull right there at 50 yards looking at us, a twin to my bull that I never saw. Two oh, of wow. them came up and I had never seen, I never saw his bull and he never saw my bull. So right about that time, he's like, shoot. And I realize what's going on. I'm like, I'm not shooting. I don't know if I killed the first bull. And he said, what do you mean? You didn't kill him. And I said, I shot a different bull. And right about this time, this bull takes off. He's fired up. He's like, dude, you didn't hit that bull. And I'm like, no, that bull's not the bull I shot at. He's like, there was two? And I said, yes. I shot one further up on the hill. And he was like, oh, my goodness. I, I never even saw the other bull. So he said, do you think you hit it? And I said, I feel good on the shot. I squeezed the trigger. But he didn't react. And he's killed a bull before, and he's called in two other bulls. Um, he's much older than me. Uh, he's had opportunities and he said, man, he said, if he walked off, they're normally like you popping a clutch on a John Deere tractor. He said, if he walked off, I don't feel good about it. Yeah. And I said, neither do I, I said, let's do this. You stay here. I'll be able to see your orange. I'm going to walk to where the bull was standing while it's fresh on my mind. And I'm going to hang my orange hat on it. And then we'll give it a few minutes eat a snack, gain our composure, and see if we can find blood. And he said, okay. So he stayed there, and I walked about 50 yards, and there was an aspen laid over a deadfall, and I stepped up on it. And when I looked down the bottom, there's a big old gold glowing belly laying there dead, and I just lost it. I've never in my entire life hunting had an emotional moment of, like, crying. But, man, Sam, I sat – I mean, it was a four-year quest, and I sat on that log, and big old tears were running down my face. Yeah. He was dead right there, and then the work started, man. It was – took some pictures, uh, and we were trying to decide what we were going to do. We were five miles from camp. Uh, you know, do we get him quartered and hang him up? Do we go get the packs and try to get him out of there? It was only, you know, 10, 15 in the morning. And I said, I feel like we can get him out of here. He's like, not if we both stay here. And I said, I'm fine. Like, I've cleaned a lot of deer. It's just a big deer. You know, I got a 
a lot of rope. I'll create some, you know, some pulleys and I'll, I'll clean this sucker by myself. And he said, all right. So he put on the, the pack. He had to go get his frame pack and we had another big frame pack in camp. And uh, I said, you go, I'll get this taken care of. And that was a little bit of a selfish opinion decision on my part. Cause I, I kind of wanted that moment of cleaning that out by myself. Yeah. And, uh, it only took me like I set a timer. No, I didn't set a timer. I did a time lapse and I went back and looked. It took me like thirty five minutes and uh right about the last time last quarter I got in a game bag and hung up in a tree. All heck broke loose. A storm came and it just started pouring. Oh man. And what should have taken him three hours to get there and back it was 4 p.m. and he wasn't back yet and i had a tarp in my bag and i had one mre and i decided i said you know bad things happen and i'm not trying to exaggerate but when you're 15 miles deep in the back country and you're with one other person like that's realistic to where it could get bad if if you get split up and things go wrong so yeah. i knew i had read enough stories that the worst thing i could do was me try to go back and him miss me and then, you know, yeah. where is whoever? So I said, I'm riding it out. I'm staying right here. I set up my tarp, built a little fire, cut a chunk off that elk, ate it right there. <laughs> and uh, finally about, I don't know, like 7 o'clock, I see orange coming through the through the woods. And uh, it was a long night. Um, oh, and I, I forgot to mention, so his brother and his son were – camping below us and they were hunting a different side of the the drainage and he went and got them and all three of them came up there which made it a lot easier yeah uh we got it all loaded onto four frame packs and started down the hill um pouring rain soaking wet uh we finally got back to camp that night and it got pretty scary my buddy's brother's son he did not drink enough water and he had not eaten anything and he was he was pretty close to being in a bad position we we got him in the tent i was running a seek outside hot tent with a stove i cranked that thing up and we got him stripped down got all his wet clothes off him and got him a, a big bowl of stock and soup threw some meat in there bacon in there and got him warmed up but it was a little sketchy there for a minute i i was worried about him yeah uh but we got him warmed up they hunted hard the rest of the week. I was on vacation, man. I got up three days in a row. For three days in a row, I'd get up, and I'd cut a chunk of backstrap off my elk hanging there. I'd eat it for breakfast, and I'd go fly fishing for three days. It was <laughs> it was the best three days of my life after that point in time. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's so. a good feeling to to not be taking it down to the wire, get it done early, oh, and for sure. be able to, to kick back and, and chill for a little bit. For I sure. I that feeling. It's good. Yep. Do you, so you talked a little bit about just the, the sign that you were reading, the, you know, what you guys were looking for when you were trying to get on these elk and everything. And the question I thought of when you were talking about that was, do you think that because of your experience as a public land hunter in a, in Texas with whitetail and that being a large part of what you look for, what you hunt for? um in your pursuit do you think that that translated and gave you an advantage in in colorado on something like this yeah um i'm a huge advocate and proponent of developing woodsmanship skills you know as you know all the gear in the world all the tech gadgets it doesn't replace just being a good woodsman and a good deer hunter um and when you hunt public land consistently you have to be a good woodsman. You have to have your senses on high at all times because you're not bringing animals to you. You're figuring out where animals are going and you're getting there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be hyper-focused on wind direction. How does wind change in thermals? How does the wind get affected in a small drainage? How can I access without bumping deer out of their bed? Noticing little rubs. What side of the tree is the rub on? That tells me he's coming from this way uh what position is a deer laying in his bed so he can catch the thermals and all that stuff i mean elk are the same as deer so 
Yes. Paying attention to how deer live their lives helped me on the elk woods because my awareness was there and my woodsmanship was good enough to pay attention to those things, to say, this bedding is here and it's facing this way because the thermals are coming up at this time. Okay, so avoid this area at that time. This is obviously a rub line and it's working this way. So this bull is traveling that route. This is a wallow, they're hitting this, you know. So yes, I think paying attention for those things helped me to be successful. Um, I think the biggest thing for me, and again, there's guys that go out there and they get on a call and they call in bulls and they do it like you see on YouTube and on, on TV and they're good at it. I knew, I mean, so like, if I hunted elk for four years, for five days in a row, that's only 20 hunts. Like, if you told somebody to go kill a mature whitetail or go kill a, a whitetail, and they only had 20 hunts under their experience, like, they're probably not going to be successful. So I knew just going in there and trying to force myself into killing an elk and force the elk to play my game wasn't going to be stacked in my odds. And part of this is, uh, is, you know, my hunting partner, you know, he's, he's killed elk. He knows what he's doing. He's, he's killed him on over the counter, uh, Colorado. So he's a good hunter to learn from. We, we hunt together. Good. That's why me and him hunt together. We hunt the same way and just, we went about it. It was very uninvasive approach. We didn't want the elk to know we were there. We were, we made sure we camped, you know, a drainage over. So they're not smelling our camp scent. And we wanted elk to not feel pressured. We wanted elk to be surprised by our presence. And it worked. I mean, those those elk, they weren't coming. And I think if we would have blown a bugle, those elk would have gone the other way. Hmm. But it, it was just enough noise, just enough sound, and we were in the right area. And we knew we were in the right area because of scouting and paying attention that I think those elk thought, hmm, that, that should be a cow. Like, that, they're, they're, that makes good sense for a cow to be up there. And I think that, I think woodsmanship helped us kill elk. Yeah. It's interesting too with, with some hunts like that, that are not in your normal wheelhouse, right? Not deer or pigs or anything in Texas. It's interesting how, um, and, and you touched on it, you know, just your, your drive and your determination as a hunter to learn the environment and learn the animal is, is heightened, you know, and, and nothing to compare to an elk hunt, but like the the mule deer hunt that I went on last year, right? I never hunted mule deer before, but I went into it open mind, ready to learn and, and do as much as, as much as I can. And, and I got put in check a couple of times too, like me and Mike are in camp and we're both whitetail hunters. And you know, these deer out there in flatland Colorado, they're not like the whitetail that him, he knows in the Midwest and I know down here. So it's like, you know, we're, there were a couple of times we were trying to hunt them like whitetail and Tim, the guy that's yeah. local is like, no, 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 you got to think about this. And you know, he was, he was right. And it's just, uh, yeah. it, you know, you gotta, you gotta be open, open-minded to that. And it's, it's just a short period of time, right? A week, you know, can be invaluable experience in, you know, your future hunting elk or mule deer, or antelope, whatever, whatever you're going after. So, right. And it's everything for the same animals. I mean, you know, they got to breed, right? they got to eat, and they got to sleep. We knew that in our timeline, breeding wasn't going to be like, I don't think breeding's your best option, and there's so many guys bugling. So we figured out we figured out where they sleep, and we figure out where they go to eat, and we try to be there when they're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. When's the yep. So when's the next trip? Man, I'm kicking around... Uh, don't know what's going to be on this schedule for next year um i might really try to key in on some more local stuff next year i'd really like to go uh get a, a turkey with my my longbow um i'd like to do a couple fishing trips and everything next year so i think next year big trips like out of state are going to be off the board and we'll get into this here in a second i would have thought that bear would have been scratched off my list this year, 
So I was thinking 2026, I'd be back in the Elkwoods, but I would imagine nothing happening really big in 2025 unless something comes up. Um, I think I'll be back in the Bear Woods next year. Uh, so probably two years from elk hunting, but um, maybe three years. And then for sure, Black Bear, hopefully back in 2025 or 2026. Well, uh, tell us tell us about the bear hunt. Tell us uh, Tell us about that experience and why it's still on the list. Yep. So, um, early May, I went to New Brunswick, Canada, um, hunted with March and Mill Outfitters. Uh, as you kind of know, I'm a little bit of a DIYer. I like to go about it the hard way and kind of earn it myself. Not that an outfitter's not earning it, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, black bear is a different ball game. Uh, four years in Colorado, we've seen one black bear. So you you'd spend a lot of time trying to spot and stalk and killing it. So. Black bear, I knew I wanted to book of somebody that ran bait barrels and have a good chance of killing a black bear. And, I mean, a bear's top of the food chain, so I had no problem going to do it that way. If it can kill me, then I'll kill it however I can. <laughs> uh, That's one way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. So I booked with them. Um, it was Sunday through a Sunday, Canada. Uh, you know, black bear to me was kind of one of those ones, a bucket list thing. Like, I thought... I'll kill one black bear, get a rug made out of it, enjoy it, make a video out of it, make a memory, and then probably maybe go do it again one day. I fell in love with it. I got to, I flew to Maine on a Saturday or a Sunday, I don't remember, and then drove across the border, got settled into camp, and hunted black bear for five straight days and absolutely fell in love with the animals. Um, the outfitter we went with, I really liked how he did things. Uh, he didn't just drop you off at the base of your tree, show you 10 trail cam pictures and say, shoot that one and then come pick you up. He lets you be very involved. If you want to go bait barrels, you can bait barrels. If you want to set up your own barrel, he, he doesn't care. He won't tell you to do that. I brought my own tree stand and hung it how I wanted it. Uh, actually, I didn't bring it. A buddy of mine brought it for me because he was driving up and I hung a stand and hunted how I wanted to, to get set up for a trad bow. And, uh, just really got to be a part of the hunt. Um, saw a lot of bears, saw moose, uh, and you know, I wasn't going to be picky. I wasn't worried about shooting a 250 pound bear. I had asked my guide, I said, Hey, I want to be respectful of your camp. Give me a, a, like a level. Like if it was a deer, like comparable to deer, like, are we shooting one twenties? Are we shooting one tens? Are we shooting one fifties only? Give me, he said, he told me, he said, a 50 gallon barrel standing up. If he's three quarters of the way up the barrel, that's acceptable. If you want to kill that, you kill that. He said, anything that's as tall as the barrel, kill it. We want you to kill it. Anything bigger, shoot. So my goal was the first bear that was three quarters inch up the bear, up the barrel, I was going to shoot to give a comparison to people that hadn't bear hunt. That's probably like killing a, I don't know, like a hundred and five hundred, like just a good eight point or something like that. Yeah. Uh, nothing huge. Uh, just a quality first bear third night i switched baits um and i had a good bear come not a good not like an acceptable bear he was he was actually not quite to the top of the barrel but not three quarters of the way he was in between uh my guy watched the video and he was like it was would have been a great bear to get and um uh, you know in my in my mind when a bear came into the barrel it was going to be a very simple flip the barrel over and just sit there on their haunches and eat. They're a lot pickier than I thought. Um, they'll come in and out, especially if they're not a big dominant bear. They'll grab a bite. They'll leave. They'll circle down wind. Their noses are absolutely incredible. I, I don't know scientifically, but I'd imagine they're, they got to be better than a whitetail. Um, blew my mind how many bears winded me. Uh, you know, actually the bigger bears almost they'll wind you, but they don't care because they're big bears and they're not afraid of you. Yeah, they're it's like dogs. the younger bears. Yeah, the younger bears. It, probably not that they're winding you. They're more scent checking to get so their butts don't get kicked by a big bear. Anyway, I had this bear come in. He flipped the barrel over away from me. So, like, if the camera's me and I'm the bear, he's sitting there facing me. I'm shooting a stick bow. I'm not going to take a frontal shot. For like 20 minutes, this bear did this. And he'd go in the barrel, he'd grab food, and he'd turn around and walk out a distance, like 50 yards. He'd eat, 
And he'd come back in, grab it, go out. Same way three times in a row. The fourth time he came in after about a 20, 30 minute span, he went in the barrel and he came out and he didn't have anything. He had no food and he turned the opposite direction and went to the entry trail of where he came in at. So obviously my brain's turning. I said, that bear just did something different. Mm -hmm. He's done feeding and he's leaving. So he was about 21 yards and I drew back. I felt comfortable with the shot. Um, and I drew back and in my mind, I went into autopilot. I picked a spot tucked right next to the shoulder, like you would on a deer. And I knew better if I'd have been in a, a good, if I'd have been thinking clearly, uh, you want to hit a bear further back. They say middle of middle. So if this is the guts and this is a perfect deer shot, this is, you know, right behind the shoulder. This is the guts. You want to hit him right here, get on the shoulder and back off five to six inches. And you can look at their, how their arteries lay out and uh, their vitals lay out and, and see that. But I just kind of went autopilot mode. I picked a spot right behind the shoulder and I let go of the arrow and I pulled the shot a little bit and I squared him smack in the middle of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was snap, like, like on a white tail, the deer, you wouldn't have had any blood, but I fully feel like the deer would have been dead in 60 yards, but I knew I was in trouble. Um, I got good penetration. I was shooting a 600 grade arrow and I probably got three quarters of my arrow all the way through him, but I knew I was in trouble because I had heard too many times you don't want to hit him far forward. Um, so I went down, looked at my arrow, and uh, I had good blood on it, but no blood on the ground. Um, walked out, called my outfitter, and he said, let me come pick you up, and uh, we'll go look in the morning. I showed him the footage. He was honest. He said, man, I don't feel good about it, uh, but we'll, we're going to give it our best shot in the morning. Sleepless night. Yeah wanted to puke uh everybody knows that feeling if you bow hunted long enough yep. and um sun up came and we gave it all we had we looked for two hours we actually got on a pretty good blood trail um not gonna lie i i was feeling pretty confident halfway into it but uh they're tough and um about two hours in there had been some awkward silence you know kind of kicking rocks and i looked at wes and i said what do you think? And he said, exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I said, let's call it. And, uh, we backed out. Um, and we had a good conversation on the way back. He said, look, he said, I'm not going to lie to you. He said, I don't like when guys say, Oh, that animal is going to live. You have no idea. He could get infected and die. You know, that's hunting. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Have no idea what happened to that bear. I hope he's a hundred percent healthy and I get vengeance on him. I don't know. But, uh, Wes told me, he said, I feel comfortable enough. If you want to keep hunting, you can. Um, and I told him, I said, yeah, I'll keep hunting. And uh, I kind of set mentally in my head. I said, I'm not shooting a bear that's any smaller than the one I wounded. And uh, I had another good bear come in on Thursday. That was a three-quarter inch bear. And if you watch the video, you see it. Um, I counted coup on him. I could have shot him, but I... I wasn't ready to finish out the week like that. I know I'll be back. And uh, uh, it was a great week, man. I mean, we had a giant bear get killed in camp. Two other good solid bears got killed. Um, Smallmouth fishing every day with a fly rod in the morning time, catching a ton of fish. It was a, a dream hunt that I'll definitely go on again. And I look forward to it. But bottom line, uh, as far as kill success, I blew it. I didn't do my part, but... Um, that's how it goes sometimes. Yeah. I I tell everybody you haven't you haven't bow hunted or haven't bow hunted long enough at least if you haven't experienced that and it's it's a sucky part of hunting, right? Nobody nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to think about that happening, nobody wants it to happen obviously, but it does. Yeah. And it's it's part of it. I told somebody just the other day, I said anybody that thinks hunters a, a true hunter Anybody thinks a true hunter is heartless and just wants to kill animals, if somehow you can make them feel what we feel when we wound an animal, they would no longer think that because it is the worst feeling. There is there is nothing we'd rather do than wound an animal. We want an ethical kill. And when you're a bow hunter, it's part of it. And what I tell people all the time, 
natural depth natural death for an animal is way worse than an arrow through the lungs or a bullet through the lungs like if they could choose you know they either starve to death or they get eaten so i i'll i'll keep my ethics and hunt as ethical as i can but i make no apologies i hate when i wound them but that doesn't mean i'll stop hunting yeah Uh, i couldn't agree more man yeah that's that's tough on a hunt like that for sure but I yep. mean, you came, you bounced back from it with the right attitude, I feel like, and, you know, did did what you can. Some unfinished yep. business up there, and you'll be back, so. So you got, you have two years to get good off a trad bow and come with me in two years. <laughs> two years. Hey, you just told me that you can, if, I, if I'm if i good enough, I can learn a week, so. <laughs> hey, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. You, you might convince me by then. That's enough time. <laughs> it's a little different when money's on the line. I, I. That was the first time I paid for a hunt like that. Money was on the line, but I told myself, I said, I'm I'm not worried about that. I'm here for the experience, but uh, it stung a little bit. Yeah. Did you have other weapon options or was was the um, trap bow? The you only... can go with him. You can actually go with him during our small rifle season. And he does a lot with muzzleloaders. And actually, uh, I've entertained booking with him to go back with my flint rock black powder because he would love it uh but i'll probably go back with the bow but yeah he does different options okay well i was just wondering for for your on your end like if you if the trad if the trad choice was your choice but yeah no it was it was trad or nothing that's awesome that's awesome i love that well um aside i'll i'll kind of start closing this out with this i want to ask you because i'm sure i asked you the last time you were on our show but i I forgot (laughs) other than other than the bear that I think is a given after that story, what else is on the bucket list for you? A bucket list for me. Um, I mean, probably number one would be an elk with my bow. Um, but I'm kind of like, I'm not saying I've like scratched the itch. Like I'm, a, I'm okay taking a break from elk cause I, I got one. So I kind of want to, you know, get another species, um, black bear elk, uh, Man, I really want to shoot a pronghorn, but I'm also a realist, and I don't. I think I'd be fine breaking out my 270 and going to shoot a pronghorn. Like, I just don't know. It could take years, unless I got on a really good waterhole hunt, and that requires sitting in a ground blind and just cooking for ten hours. (laughs) Um, pronghorn, pronghorn's gonna happen, but I think pronghorn will probably happen with a with a rifle. Yeah. But those are the big three. Um, Mule deer hasn't caught my itch yet, I think, because it's just it's a deer to me. But watching your video last year and seeing you talk about it, it'll that bug will bite me eventually. But right now, it's kind of the big three: black bear, pronghorn, elk. Um, and actually, things have backed up. I was actually booked for a pronghorn hunt in 2026, uh, but the outfitter that I was going with. It's a long story. He's having some some family issues and he's losing a lot of his property uh going through a nice divorce Mm -hmm. and um so he's refunded me my money uh because he doesn't know if he'll be able to deliver on the hunt but i have a spot whenever he calls me to say things are settled out but it could be a couple years before that happens oh wow man i'll tell you with that because i i got to i got the privilege to hunt pronghorn in 2018 and 2019 and i was successful in 2018 realized in 2019 how lucky i was <laughs> to, yes. to kill one with a bow on the on the third day but yeah that hunt in 2019 while unsuccessful that was i i think i learned a whole lot more about the animals and a whole lot more about western hunting it was only, it was only my second quote unquote western hunt not like i've had a lot since then but um it was very educational for me and in montana nonetheless so i wouldn't I wouldn't trade that hunt for the world success for success for no, for no success. It was, it was worth it. And right. I mean, you talk about the mule deer bug too, man. Like, yeah, it is, it is a deer, but especially where we went, it's a deer that doesn't, that acts different and you got to hunt yeah. them different than, than anything sure. you've done whitetail. And, you know, we, we were talking about it too, about even busting out a blind in one certain spot and trying to, trying to, you know, texas hunt these these muleys at one point but yeah um to have the opportunity to do a spot and stalk like that in just in nothing in in the grass yeah. basically was 
man, it gets your heart pumping. And yeah, oh, if you get a I chance to so do it, do it. When actually, I think, I think Brooke texted me first and said he got one, and I was so fired up, I was like fist pumping because I knew how bad you wanted that. I was so excited for you. Yeah, man, I, it was, you know, and I don't know. I've talked about it on our show, but coming off of the low of losing, we just talked about losing animals, losing a buck down here in Texas, a, a respectable buck too at that, and having to go up there, then you know, kind of just on edge you know just that feeling on like man i can't yeah. i can't kill a white tail with a compound at 40 what am i supposed to do if i got a 80 yard shot on a muley here you know what you just <laughs> can't think like that you just gotta no. power through it and 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 you couldn't but man i'll tell you like and you know the feeling it it plays in slow motion the whole thing like the second your arrow releases to impact that animal running off i can see the arrow sticking out of them and i'm just thinking go down go down go down and watching them drop is just you know, yeah. you talked about with that elk, you know, all, all the emotions hit you that, that was me out there in the, in the middle of a For freaking sure. field in Colorado. For so sure. <laughs> I know the yeah. feeling. Um, and so I was going to ask you too, like if people have asked me if you could do a Midwest hunt every year, but you couldn't hunt whitetails, would you make that trade? For muleys? Yeah. Man, I would. I mean, you would, I would hundred percent. Yeah. I, I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed that hunt. We were hunting in an area just unlike anything, just so flat, so flat. We were hunting in gun country is what we were. Yeah. And I was trying to do it with a bow and, right. and super fortunate and blessed that we were able to get it done. But that being said too, you know, you talk about Western hunts or trading, trading a whitetail hunt for a Western hunt, man, whitetail always will have a, have a special number special one spot special number one place at home you know i grew up whitetail hunting yeah. i'm always gonna whitetail hunt and it's it's right around the corner you know that's that's what yep. i do but um you know I, i'm trying to do something different me personally every year you know i want to yeah i don't want to be yes i would like to go pronghorn hunting again or mule deer hunting again but for the time being there's a whole lot of other stuff out there and i want to experience some of it so yeah there's a ton of western hunts that I'm I personally am going to go after so I'm waiting to see yeah. if I can do an elk hunt this year so we'll see cool cool yep I'm the same way I don't I don't know if I could ever walk away from white tails but there's something special about being in the midwest no man I, I got out there on uh on our place a couple days ago and and got some work done and you know just just being out there and you know putting in the work putting in scrapes trying to I mean, just the laying the groundwork, right? Laying the groundwork for what's yeah. to come and everything. It's, it's rewarding. And I get that I hunt, I hunt private land and have my setups already out there and everything, you know, it's, it's a little bit different ball game, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take an approach to it where I'm hunting smarter and yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not the kind of guy who's just going to, Oh, well I have a, I have a day to go hunt. So I'm just going to go sit in my stand and see what happens. No, if, if I'm going out there, I've intentionally Canadian set up, plan. yeah, intentionally set different stands, different directions for different winds and all this, all this other stuff. And, you know, I'm going to, if depending on what my deer are doing, I'm not going to try to push bucks. I'm going to hunt buck, certain bucks when they're daylighting and not try to bump them or put my scent down when they're nocturnal. I'm going to hunt the wind. I'm going to, I'm going to try to be smart about it. So, yeah, no, I, was, I texted you this weekend, uh, as I told you, I, for the first time in a while, I got permission to hunt a small little private place, and I was thinking about you because it's been a long time since I had private access. It's a small property, so it, I won't be able to hunt it naturally. So, man, I was out there Saturday in 100-degree weather, driving T-post, building a fence so cows don't get in it, setting yep. up a feeder, carrying corn bags. And I thought, I said, man, it's been a while since I've done this. this I mean, it's, it, it's not easy doing that either. No. It's a different type of hunting, but uh, I'm the same way. I, I prepped it for... Two different trees if i have that that's why i text you i asked you hey what's your predominant wind you're seeing yeah because i wanted a wind for southeast and one for northwest i got them set up i thought about my access and i mean that's just part of it it's just uh hunting smarter yeah no yep. I, nothing against the the weekend warriors that you know get out there when they have the opportunity and and just hunt you know if nothing else man man do that but definitely if in my opinion if you're Yes, there always is a, you know, just kind of luck of the draw with some of it, I guess. But if you're 
if you are a smart hunter and whether it's public land or private and you play your cards right that's that's how you kill kill deer and kill big deer too so for sure for sure well man i appreciate your time this evening and coming back on the show it's good to get you back on here and catch up on some stuff we'll try not to make it i enjoy it yeah try not to make it so long before we do the next one yeah it's hard getting connected on stuff uh sometimes i feel bad because we both got busy schedules but uh anytime man i love i love talking any type of hunting yeah well we'll we'll definitely do it again soon i i hated that we couldn't do it in person that was the that was the goal because we're only an hour from each other but you know like i just said schedules and everything is like uh, let's let's get it done so that works that works maybe we can do a live one uh uh around a public land campfire one night hey drag man. you up there with me i'm i'm down let's go i'm ready figure it out <laughs> yeah all right buddy um tell our listeners where they can find you if they're interested in seeing your following along with your adventures and everything yeah i'm on uh instagram jesse johnson underscore tx texas jesse johnson underscore tx i'm uh, pretty active on instagram with all kinds of ventures hunting fishing camping hiking whatever it is um, and then, uh, I also have a YouTube channel. Um, uh, they're not, uh, the highest quality as far as footage and, um, everything, but, uh, Sam's watch my videos. They, they tell a story and they, yep. they capture the moment. So I, I post a lot on YouTube and, um, I actually just, just kind of really committed. I've really enjoyed doing it lately and I'm going to try to start posting every week and, uh, just, uh, getting some more content out. But, uh, yeah, you can find that at, um, Jesse Johnson, I think underscore or Jesse Johnson TX on YouTube. If you find me on Instagram, there's a there's a link in my bio for the YouTube and uh, follow along, subscribe, and uh, uh, yeah, that's where you find me at. Awesome. Well, for our listeners, be sure that you guys do just that. Go follow Jesse and his adventures and his follow along with the journey. If you haven't already, be sure you follow, like, subscribe, all the good stuff with Fall Obsessions. Subscribe to this podcast. We drop new episodes weekly. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you again, Jesse. Appreciate you coming on. Yes, sir. Thank you, buddy. And we'll catch you guys again next week for another podcast. Talk to you then. Sounds good.